Standing on the platform of truth. Pioneer Health and Missions. All right. Well, um, let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this Sabbath day. We ask that you'll be with us and help us to grasp, understand what your word will reveal uh, this morning and help us to apply it, have that willingness of heart to apply it to our life. We thank you and we ask you these things in Jesus' name, your son. Amen. Um, good morning to every single one of you. Blessed Sabbath. Um, as you can read there from the TV screen, the title of this presentation is uh, Nehemiah Class. And whether we belong to this class or not, that's besides the point. There is a Nehemiah class. In other words, there is a people who have the characteristics and of this man by the name of Nehemiah. So uh, we want to look at some of these characteristics um, during this time. So let's do just that. So we'll begin at Joshua chapter 1, verse 7. But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Sabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of Jehovah was kindled against the children of Israel. So first, what I want to point out is that God deals with his people as a unit, as one. There's a reason for that. In other words, uh, we know that according to this account, it was Joshua who took of the accursed thing. That is a fact. But it's also a fact that God um, held um, in um, accountable the whole entire nation of Israel. It was just not Joshua. And some people might think, well, that's not fair. I didn't do the crime. Why should I have to do the time? But with God, things work quite differently. Um, and Jehovah said unto Joshua, Get thee up, wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath what? Sinned. And they, plural, not he, they, have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen, and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. So they, the children of Israel, well, if we read the account, the only person involved that actually physically took that Babylonian garment was Achan, and he hid it. He hid it in his home. And apparently their family members knew that it was there. But what was their action? Silence. Did not, they did not act. They did not um, announce this or report him to the shepherds of Israel. And so there was this accursed thing. And God, according to the Bible, held the whole entire nation responsible. Here's the principle. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 14. For the body is not one member, but what? Many. We are accountable for others in Israel. You know that saying, um, it's a scriptural saying, um, it's a question, am I my brother's keeper? Who asked that? A murderer. Am I my brother's keeper? Well, yes we are, we should be, we should be. So again, there are many, not one, but many. A holy purpose, this is uh, what Nehemiah was about. He had a purpose, and that purpose was a holy one. 
And so God's people as well uh, recognize that they have a holy purpose. His purpose then was to rebuild the temple. Let's read some of that. In Nehemiah chapter 1 verse 3, And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. Who was in affliction according to this passage? A remnant. Who is in affliction today because of the crisis or the condition of the church? A remnant. Not everyone is. That's a fact. Only a remnant are afflicted and distressed and at times quite confused because of the condition of the church today, but only a remnant, not the entire church, unfortunately. And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and did what? I wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven. He wept. It caused Nehemiah to cry. Does the condition of the church cause you to shed tears for the people of God and for the apostasy and everything that's being practiced in the church? We oftentimes, doesn't, it doesn't have an impact upon our lives. We are not our brother's keeper. We could care less what the church does. Just leave me alone and don't come in my business. It's the attitude. But that's not the characteristics or the characteristic of this man, Nehemiah. Remember, I beseech thee. Now, this is in prayer. This is Nehemiah's pr prayer. Remember, I beseech thee, the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. So if you sin, what was the result? God would scatter them. Right? But if ye turn unto me. Notice, if you turn unto me and do what? And keep my commandments and do them. Keep and do them. Though, you were of you, though there were of you cast out unto the uttermost part of, the, of heaven, yet will I gather them from, the, from thence, and I will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. So if you return unto me and you keep my commandments and you do them, I will restore you. I will gather you. I will bring, bring you back. Nehemiah is reminding um, God in his prayer. O Jehovah, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant. And to the prayer of who? Thy servants. Not only my prayer, but the prayers of your servants, your people, who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day. And grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Give me grace in the sight of the king, so that he can allow me to do um, what I so desperately want to do. And that was what was in Nehemiah's heart, the rebuilding of the temple. Southern so watchmen, uh, Sister White quote, While Nehemiah implored the help of God, he did not fold his ha own hands. Feeling that he had no more care or responsibility in the bringing about of his purpose to restore Jerusalem. With admirable prudence and forethought, he proceeded to make all the arrangements necessary to ensure the success of the enterprise. Every movement was marked with great caution. He did not reveal his purpose even to his own countrymen. For, for while they would rejoice um, in his success, he feared that by some indiscretion, they might hinder his work. Some would be liable to manifest exaltation that would arouse the jealousy of their enemies and perhaps cause the defeat of the undertaking. So this was Nehemiah. He was a man that gave forethought in what he was going to do. And he marked every move with great caution. He was wise. He was a wise man, so much so that he did not reveal his purposes even to his own countrymen, right? But we're going to learn more about that. He didn't act on his own. 
Nehemiah had been highly honored of God and had been entrusted with great responsibilities, but he did not, because of this, presume to act in an independent, self-sufficient manner. He selected a few persons whom he knew to be worthy of confidence, and to them he made known the circumstances that had led to his visit to Jerusalem, the object to be accomplished, and the plans that he purposed to employ. Thus he secured their assistance in his important undertaking. So what do we find, what do we see here of Nehemiah? He was not um, self-sufficient. He selected a few persons, but those persons were not men who he believed he can trust on. No, he knew he could have confidence in these men. And so he selected such men, and to such men he revealed his plans. All things or some things. All things are possible to those who believe, live by. To believe is to live by, to act upon these things. Sometimes things don't come, they don't happen because we don't believe. We are tested and our faith shrinks. And that's why things don't happen. We need to have a strong mind in this work. And, and everything in regards to life. Christians are a people of what? Faith. Not by sight, by faith. And how often do we forget that? We are overwhelmed by what we see. And our faith shrinks. And we become nothing. All things are possible to those who believe. No one who comes to the Lord in sincerity of heart will be what? Disappointed. How wonderful it is that we can pray effectually. That unworthy, airy mortals like ourselves possess the power of offering the request to God. What higher power can man require than this to be linked with the infinite God? Feeble, sinful man has the privilege of speaking to his maker. We utter words that reach the throne of the monarch of the universe. We pour out our heart's desire in our closets. Then we go forth to walk with God as did Enoch and Nehemiah. They don't allow their circumstances and their emotions to drown them. They're strong mentally in spirit and faith. And that's why these men conquer. Do you want to conquer? I want to conquer. So this was a, remind, a reminder for me. Men of prayer should be men of what? Action. We need to pray and act what we pray. If you need, you're praying for a job, you pray for a job and you go look for a job. You pray for the success of the cause, you pray and you act for the success of the cause. Prayer and action go together. Those who are ready and willing will find ways and means of working. Nehemiah did not depend upon uncertainties. The means which he lacked, he solicited from those who were able to bestow. He didn't wait to see, he made it happen. Right? Working together. Does it take only one man? Can only one man do the work? Jesus himself selected 12 and then 70 to carry the work forward and for it to succeed. How much more so as, as beings, human beings. So that to have success, we must work together. Then Eliashib, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing these names right, but the high priest rose up with his brethren, the priest, and they built the sheep gate. They sanctified it and set up the doors of it. Even unto the tower of Mia, they sanctified it. Unto the power of Hananiel. And next unto him builded the men of Jericho. And next to them builded Zakor, the son of Imri. But the fish gate did the sons of Hezanah build who also laid the beams thereof, and set up the doors thereof, the locks thereof, and the bars thereof. And next unto them repaired Merimoth, the son of Urijah, the son of Koz. And next unto them repaired Meshulam, the son of Berechiah, the son of Mishasabel. And next unto them repaired Zadok, the son of Bena. Everyone was active building what they were given to build. Everyone was active. 
Just like the church, under gospel order, everyone has a responsibility and everyone has a job to do under true Bible gospel order. And that's what we need. Everyone, every single member, not only the minister, the pastor, as we have been accustomed to think that he does everything. Well, no. Everyone has a responsibility in God's cause. What do you say? And there shall be like people, like priests, and I will punish them for their ways and reward them for their doings. In other words, I will, give an, I will bring an account just like the people, also the priest. They're all one. Sure, there's greater responsibility upon the minister. That's true. But if the minister doesn't um, act out or doesn't have that positive influence upon the people, what can you expect of the people? Although Nehemiah bore a royal commission requiring the inhabitants to cooperate with him in rebuilding the walls of the city, he chose not to depend upon the mere exercise of authority. He sought rather to gain the confidence and sympathy of the people, well knowing that a union of hearts and well, as well as hands was essential to success in the great work which he had undertaken. When he called the people together on the morrow, he presented such arguments as were calculated to arouse their dormant energies and to unite their scattered numbers. Notice here, well knowing that a union of hearts as well as hands was essential to success in the great work which he had undertaken. So we need to win hearts. Some of us don't have that characteristic. We don't have that, it's not part of our character or our personality. And some who are very charismatic, very smiling, very happy all the time, they win hearts with very simple, very easy. They don't, it's not an effort to them. They win hearts over. And so much so that uh, we become um, bonded or, or fond with these men that it doesn't matter what they teach. It doesn't matter what they teach. They're very loving and very kind and very Christ-like. So we say and we disregard what they're delivering as a message. And on the other hand, we have those who preach the truth but are cold. But we're learning from Nehemiah. And we have these histories so that we can learn from these men. This appeal went straight to their hearts. The manifestation of the favor of heaven toward them put their fears to shame. With new courage, they cried out with one voice. What did they say? Let us rise up and what? Build. We're in it. We're going to support um, what Nehemiah wants to do. The holy energy and high hope of Nehemiah were communicated to the people. As they caught the spirit, they rose for a time to the moral level of their leader. Each in his own sphere was a sort of what? Of Nehemiah. And each strengthened and upheld his brother in the work. So they caught Nehemiah's spirit. They, called, they caught his vision. And they united with Nehemiah. And according to this statement, they became in their own sphere a sort of that man. There is need of Nehemiah's in the church today. Not men who can pray and preach only. But men whose prayers and sermons are braced with firm an eager purpose. The course pursued by his Hebrew patriot and the accomplishment of his plans is one that should still be adopted by ministers and leading men. When they have laid their plans, they should present them to the church in such a manner as to win their interest and cooperation. Let the people understand the plans and share in the work and they will have a personal interest in its prosperity. That's what we should do. This is the counsel. The success attending Nehemiah's efforts shows, notice, it shows what prayer, faith, and wise energetic action will accomplish. So what do we need? Prayer, faith, and wise energetic action, right? Living faith will prompt to energetic action. The spirit manifested by the leader will be, to a great extent, reflected by the people. Now, watch this. 
if the leaders professing to believe the solemn, important truths that are to test the world at this time manifest no ardent zeal to prepare a people to stand in the day of God, we must expect the church to be what? Careless, indolent, and pleasure-loving. There is no seriousness in those who are bearing this message. They proclaim a message, but they live contrary to it. And unfortunately, as human beings, for the most part, we tend to do what others do. And that's why it's so important that our relationship with God and His Son is um, on an individual basis. We can follow blindly what others do, but according to this statement, what we do as leaders, we have an influence, right? Zealous of fine works. So we saw what it is to work together, working together for the cause. Therefore, Jehovah established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presence. And he had riches and honor and abundance. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of Jehovah. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. So what did Jehoshaphat do? The Bible reveals that his heart was lifted up in the ways of God, in the ways of Jehovah. But notice also he took the groves of the high places. In other words, these detestable um, idols, he eliminated them. That was also part of the reformation that um, Jehoshaphat was involved in. Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and 20 years old. A young man, and he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah, and he did that which was right in the sight of Jehovah, according to all that David his father had done. He, in the first year of his reign, in the first month, opened the doors of the house of Jehovah and did what? Repaired them. That's one of the first things he did. He repaired that which was broken down. And he brought in the priests and the Levites and gathered them together into the east street and said unto them, Hear me, ye Levites, sanctify now yourselves and sanctify thy houses, I'm sorry, the house of Jehovah, God of your fathers, and carry forth the filthiness out of the holy place. So again, a restoration which also involves the elimination of false worship. That's um, a key characteristic in God's servants. Verse 35. And also the burnt offerings were in abundance with the fat of the peace offerings and the drink offerings for every burnt offering. So the service of the house of Jehovah was what? Set in order. It was set in order. And Hezekiah rejoiced in all the people that God had prepared the people for the thing that was done suddenly. What is our purpose today? To preach and teach the truth. For what purpose? So that people can apply it, live it, correct? And in order for people to apply it and live it, it's action. And what do you expect? A restoration. Because things have been destroyed. So we need to start from scratch. Otherwise, what's the purpose? Just to hear a good message? That's not the purpose. The purpose is to restore that which has been torn down. Among the first to catch Nehemiah's spirit of zeal and earnestness were the priests of Israel. From the position of influence which they occupied, these men could do much to hinder or advance the work. Their ready cooperation at the very outset contributed not a little to its success. Thus should it be in every holy enterprise those who occupy positions of influence and responsibility in the church should be the foremost in the work of God. If they move reluctantly, others will not move at all. But their zeal will provoke very many. When their light burns light, brightly, a thousand torches will be kindled at the flame. May God help us to be Nehemiahs. A, major, a majority of the nobles of and rulers of Israel also came nobly up to their duty. But there were a few, who was these? The Tequiet nobles, who put not their necks to the work of their Lord. They didn't put no effort, they didn't 
They just sat back and did nothing. While the faithful builders have honorable, honorable mention in the book of God, the memory of these, what? Slothful servants is branded with, the, with shame and handed down as a, war, a warning to all future generations. You know, one of the illustrations of Jesus, um, and I could be wrong here in regards to the talents, or, or um, I they believe it's the talents. The one that did nothing with that which was given him, he was supposed to invest what was given to him. But he said, I knew that the king was um, hard. So what did he do? He got that and digged a hole and buried it, right? And what is the reaction? Take that good-for-nothing slave and cast him out. That was the reaction. That good-for-nothing slave, cast him out. I hope that that is not going to be said of any one of us here this morning. Good for nothing. In every religious movement, there are some who, while they cannot deny that it is the work of God, they cannot deny it, will keep themselves aloof, doing what? Refusing to make any effort to advance it. They're not in it. They refuse to make any effort to advance the cause. But in the enterprise to promote their selfish interests, watch this, to promote what? Their selfish interests. These men are often the most active and energetic workers to promote their own selfish interests. If it were well to remember, it were, it were well to remember that record kept on high, the book of God, in which all our motives and our works are written, that book in which there are no omissions, no mistakes, and out of which we are to be judged. There are every neglected opportunity to do service for God will be faithfully reported, and every deed of faith and love, however humble, will be held in everlasting remembrance. It's all being written down. There's a record, and we will stand before that record here in the day of judgment. Against the inspiring influence of Nehemiah's presence, the example of the Tekoya nobles had little weight. The people in general were animated with one heart and one soul of patriotism and cheerful activity. Men of ability and influence organized the various classes of citizens into companies, each leader making himself responsible for the erection of a certain portion of the wall. It was a sight well-pleasing to God and angels to see the busy companies working harmoniously upon the broken down walls of Jerusalem. And it was a joyous sound to hear the noise of instruments of labor from the earliest dawn to the stars appeared. Praise God. Can you imagine? El would put a smile on Jehovah's face and his son. See him from the heavens, his people working for a purpose. And what are we doing today? That's a question that you and I can only answer. Nehemiah's zeal and energy did not abate. Now that the work was actually begun, he did not fold his hands, feeling that he might let, let fall the burden. With tireless vigilance, he constantly superintended the work, directing the workmen, noting every hindrance and providing for every emergency. And let me tell you, this is not an easy task to have oversight over the work. It's stressing. Very stressful. Very stressful because you have, now you have close friends that you are tied not only probably by blood, by emotion, and yet they go off the wall. And you have to take, you have to make a decision. And it's hard. And so you have now families that probably divide. It's not, a, it's not an easy task. It's very difficult. But it's one that one has to, to make if we want to see the cause of God succeed. It all began, the great controversy, where did it all begin? In heaven. It's just being played out here. And people are making decisions every day. Friends and foes. His influence was constantly felt among the whole extent of those three miles of wall. With timely words, he encouraged the fearful, approved the diligent, or aroused the Lagarde. And again, he watched with eagle eye the movements of who? Of their enemies, 
who at times collected at a distance and engaged in earnest conversation as if plotting mischief, and then drawing near the workmen attempted to divert their attention and hinder their work. So he had his hands full, did he not? While the eye of every worker is often directed to Nehemiah, ready to heed the slightest single, his eye and heart are uplifted to God, the great overseer at the whole work, the one who put it into the heart of his servant to build. And as faith and courage strengthen his own heart, Nehemiah exclaims and his words repeated and re-echoed, thrill the hearts of the workers of all along the line, the God of heaven, he will what? Prosper us. We're not afraid. We're not afraid. Why? Because, again, his faith is what kept him going. Not the things that were going on. His faith. So, challenge. It was challenge and there was difficulties, as we can imagine. With sorrow-stricken heart, the visitor from afar gazed upon the ruined defenses of his loved Jerusalem. And is it not thus that angels of heaven survey the condition of the church of Christ? Like the dwellers of Jerusalem, we become what? Accustomed to existing evils. And often are content while making no effort to remedy them. What can we do? We often think. There's nothing we can do. But how are these evils regarded by beings divinely illuminated? Do, they, do not they, like Nehemiah, look with sorrow, sorrow burdened hearts upon ruined walls? And gates burn with fire. So again, the sight, the, 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 the sight of the remnant, those that see the conditions of the church, they are affected by it. But it came to pass that when Sambalat heard that we builded the wall, he was wroth. He took great indignation and mocked the Jews. And he spake before his brethren and the army of Samaria and said, what do these feeble Jews, what do these feeble Jews? Will they fortify themselves? Will they sacrifice? Will they make an end in a day? Will they revive the stones out of the heaps of the rubbish which are burned? Now Tobiah the Ammonite was by him, and he said, Even that which they build, if a fox go up, he shall even break down their stone wall. Hear, O our God. For we are despised and turn the reproach upon their own head and give them for a prey in the land of captivity. So here we have record of some of the um, claims that were being thrown at those that were very active in the rebuilding of the temple. Those who were restoring the defenses of Jerusalem did not go forward in their work unmolested. Satan was busy in stirring up opposition and creating what? Discouragement, you know, that's one of well, that's his favorite tool to discourage, and probably the most effective tool to discourage. The principal agents in this movement were Sambalat the Heronite, Tobiah the Ammonite, and Geshan the Arabian. These idolaters had exulted in the feeble and defenseless condition of the Jews and had mocked at their religion and ridiculed their devastated city. And when the work of rebuilding the wall was entered upon, they, with envenomed zeal, set themselves to hinder the undertaking. To accomplish this, notice, they attempted to do what? To cause division among the workmen by suggesting doubts and arousing unbelief as, their, as to their success. This is one of the, the, the instruments that's going to be used or that's being used. One, to cause division and to doubt at the, at whatever it is that you're doing to help the cause of God to have you lack faith and to embrace the thought that it's not going to succeed. This is what the enemy wants us to believe. They also ridiculed the efforts of the builders, declared the enterprise as an impossibility, and predicted what? A disgraceful failure. It ain't going to happen. It's not going to happen. Well, let, let, we'll leave that in God's hands. We need to do what God tells us to do. And that's what we need to do. But that was the claims 
the experience of Nehemiah is repeated in the history of God's people in this time. Those who labor in the cause of truth will find that they cannot do this without exciting the anger of its enemies. Though they have been called of God to the work in which they are engaged, and their course is approved of him, they cannot escape, they cannot escape reproach and derision. They will be denounced as visionary, unreliable, scheming, hypocritical, anything in short that will suit the purpose of their enemies. And all for one purpose, to discourage them to carry on the work. The most sacred things will be represented in a ridiculous light to amuse the ungodly. A very small amount of sarcasm and low wit, united with envy, jealousy, and piety and hatred, is sufficient to excite the mirth of the profane scoffer. In these presumptuous jesters, sharpen one another's ingenuity and embolden each other in their blasphemous work. Contempt and derision are indeed painful to human nature. Watch what she says. But they must be endured by all who are true to God. We must endure all these things if we are to be true to God. It is the policy of Satan thus to turn souls from doing the work which the Lord has laid upon them. So that's what the enemy wants to do, to discourage us from carry, carrying forward that which God has revealed. So we need to be, we need to pre persevere. Salvation is for those who finish the race because even in a physical, secular race, many begin, but not all finish. And many have joined in the ranks of the Christian marathon, but only few will finish. Um, it hurts me because even as I said that, um, there's many that I know today that are no longer in this race. Many who have passed, and I don't know whether they'll be saved or lost, who gave up the race and lost and were died in the world. So again, many will begin this race, but not everyone will finish it. So we need to persevere and be devoted. Nehemiah and his companions did not shrink from hardships. Do you shrink from hardships? We are not to shrink from hardships or excuse themselves from trying service, neither by night nor by day, not even during the brief time given to slumber, did they put off their clothing or even lay aside their armor. So neither I, nor my brethren, nor my servants, nor the men of the guard which followed me, none of us put off our clothes, saying that everyone put them off for washing. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Pilgrim's Progress. But it reminded me of a man by the name of, I believe, when Spanish is flexible, but I, remember, I don't remember or recall what he's called in English. But the point is that he, he's moved according to the circumstances. He takes on the journey to paradise, so the holy city. And he's constantly asking, how far? How far from the holy city? Because he's tired of the walk. And lo and behold, in their journey, they fall into this swamp. And he manages to get out of this swamp. And he says, this road is too, it's, it's too difficult. It's just too difficult. I'm going back. And he goes back. Well, these men, they endure hardships. And trying once to the uttermost. My son was just telling me about a martyr, but that's another story of what he went through. None of us have gone through that and yet had the faith to endure even unto death. That's the faith that we need. Nehemiah was engaged in an important work, one which concerned the prosperity of the cause of God. Every effort previously put forth to accomplish that work had failed because of what? of a lack of true faith and union of effort. If we lack true faith and union of effort, we won't succeed. The Samaritans, disguising their enmity under a pretense of fidelity to the king of Persia, has succeeded in causing a discontinuance of the work. The zealous and true-hearted among the Jews had again and again been disappointed in their purposes. We've tried this before. 
and we, we can't succeed. But yet Nehemiah said, no, we're going to succeed. And we're going to do this again. But in the strength of God, that was his strength. God was his strength. That's why this man conquered. Because God was his strength. But in the strength of God, Nehemiah determined that the adversaries should not again hinder the work. The despisers of the God of heaven should be disappointed. Their satanic policy could not succeed if the people of God were bar the doors against the enemy and work harmoniously to carry out the divine will. Notice this. The foe could not enter unless the gates were thrown open by what? Traitors within. There will always be traitors. Judah, was he a traitor? Yes. Yes, and unfortunately, um, he didn't, his ending was not uh, a good ending. I praise God that there will always be a remnant. The important point is that, am I a part of that remnant? A good talk, a good prayer, doesn't make me part of that remnant. Would you agree? Is to live like the man that we just read about. To live and act upon faith and have courage the way he did is to be part of that remnant. Among the children of Israel scattered in heathen lands, as a result of 70 years captivity, there were Christian patriots, men who were true to principle, men who esteemed the service of God, how? Above every earthly advantage. Men who would honor God at what? At the loss of all things. You mean at the loss of my house? You mean at the loss of my land? You mean at the loss of all my money or my bank account? At the loss of all things. Do you belong to this class? Do I belong to this class? Or do I care so much for my belongings that I, like the young ruler, turn around and leave disappointed? Because I'm being asked too much. If we are, what does it say? But loyal and true. Every attack of the enemy will lead us to a firmer reliance upon God. And to more determined effort to carry forward his work. Against what? All opposing influences. So what do we need? We need to be loyal and true. It ain't going to get easier. This run is not going to get easier. It's only going to get harder. And I pray that I and yourselves can continue on this path. Don't give up. That's what we're counseled by Paul. Faint not. Don't faint. Don't give up. Keep running. Keep running. And these um, writings from the Bible and the spirit of prophecy are there to encourage us to do such, to keep running and not forget our purpose and to hold on for Jesus is coming soon. So with that, um, let's kneel if we can so that we can pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Um, we thank you that uh, these things have been written as we read in your word for our admonition. So we pray that we can continue, Father, and that not only continue, but that we can reconsecrate our life to thee and for your service and to do what we can um, to advance it. We thank you and we ask that you'll be with us throughout the remainder of this, your holy Sabbath day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Standing on the Platform of Truth Pioneer Health and Missions